Tonight, the surprise witness and the explosive testimony, a Trump White House insider testifying about then-President Trump's behavior on January 6th. The shocking allegation that tonight, a source close to the Secret Service says never happened. Plus the blistering response from the former president today and the new accusations Trump allies are intimidating witnesses. Also, the human smuggling horror in San Antonio. More than 50 migrants from Mexico and Central America found dead inside an abandoned big rig that was baking in sweltering temperatures. At least a dozen others, including children, rushed to the hospital. Tonight, a look at the dangerous journey many take for a better life before even reaching U.S. soil. Moment of impact, the new video showing the deadly mall strike in Ukraine. People inside a nearby park sent running, even jumping into a pond to escape falling debris. Crews digging through rubble to find any survivors as world leaders call the attack a war crime and say Putin should be held responsible. Plus the deadly prison fire in Colombia, more than 50 inmates killed, outraged family members clashing with authorities outside the prison as they demand answers. The neighborhood war zone, bullets flying on a Philadelphia street in broad daylight. One man crawling underneath a car to hide from the gunshots. At least two people killed, and now the manhunt for the gunman. And Ghislaine Maxwell, sentenced, the former girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein, getting 20 years for grooming and recruiting young girls for the convicted sex offender. So, does the case end here? And what does it mean for the victims? Top Story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight we're starting with that shocking testimony about former President Trump's behavior on January 6th. But just moments ago, a source close to the Secret Service disputing some of those claims, including an allegation of violence against an agent by the president. Cassidy Hutchinson, a former aide to then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, testifying before the January 6th committee during a surprise hearing. Hutchinson saying that the former president knew rioters were armed when he urged them to march on the Capitol. She also alleged Trump became physical with one of his bodyguards when they refused to take him to the Capitol building. However, a source telling NBC News that never happened. Trump immediately slamming the testimony online, calling Hutchinson a, quote, phony. But also today, Congresswoman Liz Cheney warning there have been attempts to intimidate witnesses by Trump's allies. There's a lot to get to tonight, so let's get right to NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander. Tonight, explosive new testimony from a Trump White House insider, Cassidy Hutchinson, that as the riot was starting to unfold at the Capitol on January 6th, there was a dramatic physical confrontation inside the presidential limousine between former President Trump and the head of his own Secret Service detail, Bobby Angle, after Mr. Trump was told his security would not take him to the Capitol. Once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol, and when Bobby had relayed to him we're not, we don't have the assets to do it, it's not secure, we're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Hutchinson, a top aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, says a senior staffer told her what happened in the motorcade moments after the president's speech, that an irate Mr. Trump tried to grab the steering wheel. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel and Mr. When Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. Hutchinson saying even before his rally, Mr. Trump was aware of the potential for violence at the Capitol when he was told some supporters were armed and would not go through security. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. All as security had spotted Trump supporters carrying AR-15s. I got three men walking down the street in fatigue carrying AR-15s. Copy at 14th and Independent. Hutchinson says she first heard of plans for President Trump to make an unannounced trip to the Capitol from Rudy Giuliani days before January 6th. Plans alarming then White House counsel Pat Cipollone. Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, 
please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. And she described flashes of anger from the president, saying she walked in after he threw his lunch across the room following Attorney General William Barr's declaration that there was no widespread voter fraud. I first noticed there was ketchup dripping down the wall and there's a shattered porcelain plate on the floor. There was no cross-examination today on the Democratic-led committee that Republicans have slammed as partisan. While Mr. Trump responded, I hardly know who this person, Cassidy Hutchinson, is, calling her a total phony and leaker, who he says is very upset and angry because he turned her down for a job when he left office, writing, her fake story that I tried to grab the steering wheel is sick and fraudulent. Her story of me throwing food is also false. And, quote, I didn't want or request that we make room for people with guns to watch my speech. Who would ever want that? Punctuating today's hearing, accusations from the committee about efforts to pressure witnesses to give false testimony, citing examples of what they described as serious concern over an intimidation campaign and a call one unnamed witness received. Quote, what they said to me is as long as I continue to be a team player, they know I'm on the right team. I'm protecting who I need to protect. You know I'll continue to stay in good graces in Trump world. And they have reminded me a couple of times that Trump does read transcripts. And just keep that in mind as I proceed through my interviews with the committee. All right, Peter Alexander joins us tonight. Peter, I know you have some major new reporting. A source close to the Secret Service is telling you that, that the lead agent disputes some of Hutchinson's testimony? Yeah, so let's walk right through that now, Tom, if we can. That source close to the Secret Service uh, tells me that both the lead agent, Bobby Engel, and the driver of that presidential limousine, the SUV, are prepared to testify under oath that neither man was assaulted and that Mr. Trump never lunged for the steering wheel. Again, we haven't heard from either of these individuals under oath publicly. They did both testify in the past. It's unclear whether they were asked a specific question as re related to this incident. We are reaching out to the committee for more details on that. Separately, Tom Hutchinson today also said that she heard that Mr. Trump had agreed to deliver a speech on January 7th condemning the violence only after AIDS warned him that the 25th Amendment might be used. We should note we have reached out to Mark Meadows and to Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, neither of whom so far has commented. So, um, Peter, Peter, I want to go back to some of that new reporting you have. The former president has, was already slamming Hutchinson as a phony. You've reported this. Is this now going to ruin her credibility as it gives the former president's allies more ammo? Well, you know, I can't speak to that. I think Americans will make their own judgments. But I think a 25-year-old with tremendous courage going out there and speaking about her experiences, some of which she heard directly the president's words, uh, I don't think it ruins her credibility. I think there may be some moments in what she testified today that there will be some pushback on. Remember, there's no cross-examination in a January 6th committee hearing like the one we heard today. But the bottom line is, if anybody's going to push back, the only way to do it is to do it under oath and, frankly, to do it like she did on the record in public. Public. So we wait to see whether we'll hear from the limo driver or from that lead detail, the lead Secret Service agent as well. At the end of the day, I think most Americans are going to be struck by the detail with which she could speak, the conversations that she was in, the contemporaneous notes that she kept at the time about her conversations with the chief of staff, with the White House counsel, and frankly, what she saw in person as she detailed that moment inside the, the White House dining room where she saw the damage that the president had inflicted on the, what it was, it the, the ketchup against the wall and the glassware as well. She was in that room. No one can dispute what she saw. Three, two. All right, Peter Alexander leading us off tonight. Peter, we thank you. The bombshell testimony on the inner workings of the West Wing on January 6th and the days leading up to it, not only shedding light, but blasting a spotlight on what was happening at the White House. I want to bring in NBC News political director and meet the press moderator, Chuck Todd. Chuck, there's no doubt this was explosive, but what does this change now? Does this open up the former president to any legal problems? And do you think this compels more Trump insiders to come forward? Well, I think there's two things to... Well, look, the... The testimony was obviously explosive. It's still, I'll be honest, I'm still reeling. It is hard to believe that we as a country had a president of the United States behave as shockingly as he behaved as what was described by Ms. Hutchinson. But as for what the impact of today's testimony, if it leads to more people feeling the need they now have to come forward, if a 25-year-old former staffer has the guts to come forward, White House counsel Pat Cipollone shouldn't uh, be scared uh, to come on. 
I think the fact is that this likely could either guilt or feel or, or some form of pressure on some of these folks who haven't talked. But it was the bombshell at the end. I mean, this was a day filled with them when Liz Cheney uh, laid out an accusation of witness tampering, Tom. That is a crime. That is another thing now in the bucket for the Department of Justice. So, look, all of it right now is hearsay. They don't have it, but th that's, a, that's a heavy accusation. And they certainly created, you know, certainly have laid the groundwork for the idea of intimidation in different aspects of it. So the believability of, of, of witness uh, uh, tampering or intimidation is possibly there. You're going to have to have others come forward. But that allegation out there, I have to tell you, Tom, if the Justice Department is not investigating the former president directly yet, this accusation could lead to it. The president, the former president, is already calling Hutchinson no. a phony. But, but does this change the dynamic for anybody who is running for office, right, who's a Republican, for elected members of Congress who have been defending the president? Do you think this testimony really changes something? If this testimony leads to more testimony, Tom, if this is a one-off and she's on her own, you know, look, we've been down this road so many times. Oh, this is it. This is when the Republican Party is going to say enough is enough with Trump. Look, I'm not going to sit here and, and, oh, and, and, and try to make that prediction again, right? It started when he, when he attacked John McCain uh, that very first time when he started running for president. And everybody thought, oh, boy, that's not going to, that, that'll kill him. What sort of destroys other political careers hasn't destroyed Donald Trump. But what I just can't, I cannot imagine that o the only one with guts to speak about the president's actions that day is going to be a 25-year-old staffer. Not the White House counsel, not, you know, not some of these other folks are going to be willing to come. I think this will lead to more testimony. But if it doesn't, that just tells you how strong, um, how strong the fear runs inside the GOP. Tonight, Chuck, we thank you for that. We want to turn out to the other major story we're covering tonight, the tragedy in South Texas. More than 50 migrants are dead after the tractor trailer smuggling them into the U.S. was abandoned in scorching heat. Morgan Chesky has the latest from San Antonio. On the edge of San Antonio, a horrific human tragedy. Officials confirming 51 migrants died after being packed inside a semi-tractor trailer. The truck discovered late Monday baking in the Texas summer heat. Quite a few of them are already deceased. Firefighters arrived after someone reported hearing calls for help, opening the doors to a grim scene. With no water, no air conditioning, no means for ventilation, and they suffered. They suffered before they died. 16 survivors, including four children, were rushed to nearby hospitals. Several later died, bringing the death toll to 39 men and 12 women. Mexican authorities identified 22 victims as Mexican nationals, seven others from Guatemala, and two migrants from Honduras. Police took three people into custody, but have yet to say if they're connected to what they call an apparent smuggling plot. Calling the tragedy preventable, San Antonio's mayor pointed at Washington gridlock over immigration. This is another manifestation of uh, an immigration system that lawmakers who are in charge of it uh, refuse to deal with. You it's, believe the system has failed? It's failed these families, it's failed our country, it's failed the entire North American continent. Texas Governor Greg Abbott also sounding off, writing, these deaths are on Biden and a result of his deadly open border policies. In a statement, President Biden said, exploiting vulnerable individuals for profits is shameful, as is political grandstanding during tragedy. Back at the site, Angelita Olvera placed two crosses to pay tribute. I didn't know them, but they are human, she told us. It's so sad. We should all have an opportunity for a better life. All right, Morgan Chesky joins us now live from San Antonio. Morgan, you mentioned three arrests, but it's still unclear the connection to the smuggling operation. Yeah, Tom, that's right. And as this memorial only grows here at the site, we are learning more about two of those three individuals taken into custody. Uh, they've been identified as Mexican nationals that authorities say they were able to find by taking the license plate on that semi truck right on this very road and tracing it to a San Antonio home where they located these two men. We're told that both of them have not only overstayed their visas here in the United States, but were in illegal possession of multiple firearms. Tom.
All right, Morgan Chesky on a very, very sad story for us. This recent tragedy now shedding some light on the dangerous and often deadly risk many migrants take in trying to reach the U.S. Since 2014, nearly 3,000 people have died attempting to cross at the Mexico-U.S. border, making it one of the deadliest in the world for migrants. NBC's George Solis is taking a deeper dive tonight into that danger. Tonight across Latin America, heartbreak and anger. Porque estos hechos lamentables que desde luego tienen que ver con la situación de pobreza, de desesperación de hermanos centroamericanos, de mexicanos. Officials in Mexico, Guatemala and Honduras hoping to give back some dignity to the men and women who died slowly in a hot truck. The tragedy in San Antonio now appears to be the deadliest human smuggling case in U.S. history. Creemos, estamos convencidos de que nuestros migrantes merecen respeto, pero especialmente justicia. But tragically, we've seen this before. The journey is dangerous long before migrants ever reach U.S. soil, as tighter immigration policies push people to extremes to avoid being caught. In December, 55 Central Americans were killed in the Mexican state of Chiapas when the truck they were crammed into flipped over. And yesterday's gruesome San Antonio discovery closely mirrors an incident in the city in 2017. Ten migrants died during grueling summer heat while packed into a truck carrying 39 people. The driver, James Matthew Bradley, was sentenced to life in federal prison without parole. Two years before, calma, 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 calma. a dramatic rescue as sheriff's deputies rescued migrants gasping for air from a truck in Frio County, Texas. 39 migrants, including a 13-year-old boy, were saved from 100-degree heat. The asylum system in the United States is broken. Guadalupe Correa Cabrera is a professor at George Mason University. Would you say that as a result, as you put it, of this broken system, that it's forcing so many undocumented migrants to take these dangerous alternatives to try and get into the country? But the core issue in the United States is to solve and to fix this immigration and asylum system that is broken. So far this year, authorities have encountered more than a million migrants along the southwest border. At least 650 died last year trying to cross Mexico's border into the U.S. The Rio Grande has proven a deadly trap for many, while heat, exhaustion and exploitation await others crossing thousands of miles of seemingly endless desert. Those that make it are still far from salvation. As unimaginable as this tragedy is, do you fear that until there's real change, we'll see more repeat of incidents like what we just saw in San Antonio? Absolutely. This is what we were expecting. And we don't know how many of these incidents have not been covered by the media because migrants are invisible. Dreams of a better life, too often ending in tragedy. All right, George joins us now from Los Angeles live tonight. And George, as you mentioned, this is not the first time We've seen a tragedy like this, but what are advocates saying about the root cause causes that pushes so many people to jump into a tractor trailer like that and try to head to the U.S.? Yeah, Tom, here where I'm standing in Los Angeles, 20 countries recently signed to an agreement earlier this month to help address the flow of people across the Americas. Advocates say it's a good start, but more countries need to be involved, especially those that are large drivers of migration like Venezuela and Nicaragua. Now, here at home, advocates say both political parties also need to work together to reform asylum. Adding this latest tragedy underscores the heavy costs many pay while these discussions continue. Tom. All right, George Solis for us tonight. George, we thank you. Next to that deadly Amtrak derailment in Missouri, several people killed after a train slammed into a dump truck and went off the rails. Tonight, growing questions from residents in that area who say they've been calling for safety improvements at that intersection for years. NBC's Maggie Vespa is on the scene tonight. New details emerging about the moments after the deadly Amtrak derailment. Boy Scouts racing to the rescue, pulling fellow passengers from flipped cars. I'm just going to immediately start helping as many other people as I physically can. The crash happened Monday afternoon in Menden, Missouri. An Amtrak train colliding with a dump truck, sending eight cars and two locomotives careening off the tracks. Four dead, including the truck's driver. 15-year-old Elijah Scripsack said he provided aid to the driver during his last moments. What were you hoping to do for him? Just trying to keep him comfort. Um, just try to slow down the blood, the blood loss. Damn it. It happened. At least 150 transported to hospitals. I looked out the window. I saw the dust cloud. And the next thing you know, the car is rolling. Damn. We hit a truck. 
The dump truck investigators say sat at a passive crossing. The National Transportation Safety Board now on scene. There were no arms, there were no warning lights, there were no bells. Tonight, farmer Mike Spencer says he's known this crossing was dangerous for years. Amtrak comes through here at, at anywhere from 75 to 100 miles per hour. If you make a mistake, this, you know, this is, is got the potential of happening just like it happened. Records indicate the state of Missouri had also flagged this crossing for safety improvements. Transportation Secretary one. Pete Buttigieg California. telling Lester the White House is pledging more than half a billion dollars to eliminate dangerous crossings. We know this is an issue, and it's an issue that has affected many communities. The fewer points we have in the country where it's even physically possible for a train and a car to collide, the safer this country will be. Scout leaders from Wisconsin praising their troops. I mean, for, for 14 to 17 year old boys to keep calm more than everybody else, I mean, that's, that's something that you don't see a whole lot. I don't know, I think it's just kind of instinct for all of us because the first thing that came into my mind was just to make sure that everyone was okay. Inspiring courage amidst another tragedy on the rails. Maggie Vespa joins us now live from Menden, Missouri. Maggie, as you reported there, the state of Missouri knew that this was a dangerous intersection. Do we know why there was no action taken to address that? Well, Tom, people living in and around Menden, Missouri would probably tell you to them it feels like a case of good old-fashioned complacency, frankly, and government not wanting to spend the money because, as you said, the state of Missouri had flagged that very crossing as deserving of what they called safety improvements, but now cut to this week. It's the site of a deadly crash and the subject of a federal investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board, an investigation so broad, I'll add, that they cleared media away from the crash site to this kind of random local school to give us those briefings today so they could bring in heavy machinery in mass and start combing through that wreckage. Tom. Maggie Vespa on the scene for us. Maggie, we thank you for that. We head overseas now to Ukraine. The death toll rising after a Russian airstrike obliterated a crowded shopping mall. At least 20 civilians were killed. New surveillance video showing the moment that blast rocked a nearby park. Look at that. You can see debris flying from the sky. Some people actually jumping into the pond to take cover. Investigators now combing through the rubble, searching for evidence of a possible war crime. Richard Engel traveled to that site. This shopping mall was incredibly crowded when it was struck. According to President Zelensky, there were a thousand people in here when a Russian cruise missile landed and set fire to this entire place. And it, it is very large. We're talking about 100,000 square feet that was completely burned. And it's not surprising that it was crowded because this area has not been attacked before and people had what was clearly a false sense of confidence that they would be safe. There are not military targets in this area. We're not close to the front line. And that is why Ukrainians say that Russia did this deliberately to terrorize the population, to make Ukrainians feel unsafe in towns and cities that generally are safe. And that, they say, is a war crime. So in addition to the rescue crews who are now mostly looking for remains at this stage, there are war crimes, prosecutors, investigators here looking for evidence. And Ukrainians want the Russians to be held accountable for what has happened here and what has happened in many locations that have been bombed throughout this conflict that had no apparent military value. Richard Engel on that incredibly horrific attack there in Ukraine. Uh, back here at home, we are tracking some serious weather. The, the tropics is bubbling up. Three separate systems brewing with the possibility of developing into tropical storms. The first of those storms taking aim at Trinidad and Tobago, where a tropical storm warning is in effect. Residents there packing sandbags, bracing for potential flooding. For the latest track and where these storms could be heading next, let's get right to meteorologist Bill Caring. So, Bill, how serious of a threat are these three systems? I mean, first off, it's ridiculous. We're tracking three different systems at this time of year. I mean, this is supposed to be the, the quiet part of the hurricane season. I mean, this is like tracking three at one time is what we do in like August and September at the peak, what we expect. As far as which one we're most concerned with, that's the one that's heading through Trinidad and Tobago right now. They're seeing the worst of the squalls, and that's what it is. It's gusty winds and squalls coming through. They're not going to expect to see a lot of damage video or anything like that. As it moves right to the north of Venezuela, it's going to be very close to land, so that's why it's not going to really increase in intensity anytime soon. But even Aruba is under a tropical storm warning, and that'll move through as we go throughout the day tomorrow. So here's the latest on the system. And again, it's 
not Tropical Storm Bonnie yet. When you wake up tomorrow morning, it likely will be Tropical Storm Bonnie. Uh, winds are about 40 miles per hour, and it's moving pretty fast, too, at the west at 24 miles per hour. And from the Hurricane Center, here's our latest forecast path. Again, very close to the north coast of Venezuela, over the top or very near Aruba. And then it has a little window of opportunity to get a little bit stronger up to a hurricane than possible, but heading for Nicaragua. And that would be late Friday into early Saturday. So in Nicaragua, they're probably going to start preparation soon. We're pretty confident all of these little squiggly lines show different paths that our computers are telling us. That's why we have excellent confidence. We are safe in the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico is safe. It really looks like a problem for Nicaragua. Now let's go to number two. And this is the area we've been watching for the last three or four days. It's just a little swirl in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Of course, it's close to the Texas coastline in Louisiana that are immediately you know, sets alarm bells off because anything in this area is over very warm water. 40% chance of development. The biggest issue with this is going to be the heavy rains. It has plenty of warm water to develop, but we're expecting maybe three inches of rain. Isolated flooding possible in the next couple of days, especially Houston, the Galveston, and the other area is way out in the Atlantic. Not concerned with that at all. Only a 20% chance that that develops. All right, Bill, we appreciate that. Still ahead tonight, Maxwell sentenced. The former girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein said to spend decades behind bars for sex trafficking. The reaction from victims who were inside that courtroom, plus the deadly shootout caught on camera, bullets flying on a Philadelphia street in broad daylight, the manhunt tonight for the gunman. And the desperate search for a missing 19-year-old who vanished from a Utah farm one month ago. The massive reward now being offered. Stay with us. And we're back tonight with the sentencing of Ghislaine Maxwell. She was sentenced today to two decades in prison for sex trafficking crimes committed with Jeffrey Epstein. Her victims were in court providing dramatic statements on the damage to their lives. Tom Winter was there. Tonight, Ghislaine Maxwell, who worked hand in hand with Jeffrey Epstein to traffic and sexually abuse young girls, sentenced to 20 years behind bars with five more years of supervised release. The judge going beyond the sentencing guidelines, but not as far as prosecutors had hoped, plus hitting her with the maximum fine. Maxwell speaking to the victims for the first time. She acknowledged their suffering without taking personal responsibility, telling them, quote, I am sorry for the pain you have experienced, and that she hoped her incarceration will bring, quote, closure in some measure of peace. Several of those women at court in person today sharing their experiences of abuse and trauma. Uh, I spent the last 17 years in my own prison for what she, Jeffrey, and all the co-conspirators did to me. I was raped repeatedly. I was raped three times a day sometimes. In court and in her court filings, Ransom detailed her two attempts at suicide because of how the abuse made her feel. Annie Farmer, another victim, saying, quote, I felt tremendous survivor guilt. Maxwell didn't look at her as Farmer broke down in tears, saying, quote, we all felt powerless. Maxwell, once a prominent socialite who consorted with royals, presidents, and billionaires, was convicted on five counts in December, including sex trafficking, conspiracy, and enticing a minor to travel across state lines for the purposes of illegal sex. Dozens of women accused Epstein of abuse, many saying that Maxwell recruited them initially to give massages to the billionaire. But today, the victims with the final word. An attorney for Virginia Giuffray reading, quote, there's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't ask why. Why did you hurt us so much? Despite all the statements, Maxwell's lawyers tried to make a case she'd been a positive influence on other inmates, offering to teach yoga and assist others in getting GED certificates. Also bringing up her alleged treatment in jail the judge in her decision rejecting those arguments, calling a, quote, pattern of deflection of blame. The judge saying Maxwell's conduct deserved a substantial sentence and saying what so many victims had hoped for for years, quote, nobody is above the law. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Winter joins Top Story now from Lower Manhattan outside of federal court. Tom, so the judge handing down a pretty heavy sentence here, but it could have been worse for Maxwell, correct? 
Uh, absolutely right, Tom. So had this conduct continued into 2004, which is when the sentencing window or the sentencing guidelines, basically kind of the, the rules of the road for the judge, had that conduct continued into 2004, she could have used new penalties, stiffer penalties, what the prosecutor was hoping for, which is 30 to 55 years for Maxwell, which, because the former socialite is 60 years old, would have effectively been a life sentence. Right. And, and Tom, can you touch on the news that Maxwell was put on suicide watch heading into the sentencing? And, and I ask this because I, I know we, we saw the victims there. They testified. Uh, you were in contact with them. Were they satisfied with this result? And do they have any faith in the system that Maxwell will not commit suicide like Jeffrey Epstein did? Well, two key questions. So the suicide watch started on Friday when Maxwell sent an email to the inspector general of the Bureau of Prisons saying she thought prison staff might try to harm her. They asked her about that, and psychologists asked her about that, and she didn't elaborate on the details. So they were a little concerned, potentially, that she was trying to get in a jail cell by herself where potentially she could harm herself, as you mentioned, as what we saw with Jeffrey Epstein. We anticipate that if things go according to plan, and this is something that happens commonly when somebody's about to be sentenced, that they do go on that suicide watch, expect her to be taken off of that in the coming days. From the broader picture that you mentioned, the victims certainly speaking today about a need for justice. We have some initial indications from some of the victims that they're happy with the end result of this, that she is going to be in jail for at least 20 years and that super release as well. I think it's important to note this is a rare case where we see 20, 25, even 30 years after the abuse, Tom, the impacts on these victims that they could testify about the long-term psychological impacts on them just really underscores the type of damage that could be done in sexual abuse cases. Tom Winter for us. Tom, thank you. We want to turn out to a deadly shootout on the streets of Philadelphia. I'll cut on surveillance. People in a residential neighborhood sent running for safety, some crawling under cars to hide from gunfire. NBC Stephen Romo has the shocking images. Tonight, police trying to find the gunman who sparked what investigators are calling a massive shootout in South Philadelphia. You took some valuable lives. Um, you jeopardized children that was out here um, playing, starting a summer. Surveillance video obtained by the Philadelphia NBC station from police sources shows the firing began last Thursday night. It starts barely in frame, but the crowd takes off running for safety and the action moves right in front of the camera. One person can even be seen scrambling under a parked car trying to get away from flying bullets. Someone nearby takes cover between two vehicles. Another person appears to fire back before being struck. Finally, a shooter can be seen running up to Raheem Hargis and Vincent Jackson, both 36 years old, and firing at them as they were both on the ground. We've blurred the most graphic parts of this video. Hargis' widow, who asked that her face not be shown on camera out of fear the shooters might return, spoke about no, discovering her husband had been shot. No, I just kept screaming where my husband at. And uh, when his sister came out, his grandmother's door, he was laying on the ground, and the cops picked him up and put him in the cop car. Police confirming both victims were pronounced dead later that evening at a local hospital. Two men in their 20s are in critical condition. Police say a weapon was recovered at the scene, but no arrests have been made in the ongoing investigation. Police telling NBC Philadelphia they believe the men were targeted and investigators are looking for four suspected shooters and a 2015 or 2017 silver Hyundai Sonata. The shootout, a frightening display of an ongoing problem for Philly. As of Monday, crime statistics from Philadelphia police show there have been 252 homicides in the city. That's actually down slightly from this time last year, but 2021 was a record with 562 homicides. For perspective, New York City had fewer homicides than Philly last year, but New York has more than five times the population of Philadelphia. The community is going to, going to have to get more involved. They're going to have to become more to eyes and ears of the police. And police are going to have to put more resources into determining who are the persons behind this extreme gun violence. The families of Hargis and Jackson killed in this incident are joining many other victims' families asking why this happened to their loved ones. It's gonna take us a long time to get over this senseless murder.
All right, Stephen Romo joins us now. Stephen, I, I think the only thing more shocking in that video are the crime stats, are those murder stats, right? Especially when you compare it to New York City. It, it feels like, and it sounds like, Philadelphia is becoming one of the most deadliest places in this country. And you were just telling me the homicides are down, but people are still being killed there every day. Yeah, it's a little deceptive, down 6% than they were this time last year. But last year was just a record high. It is, uh, last year was 56% times higher, percent higher rather, than 2019. And that's double the homicides we've seen from 2016. So the number continues to rise from these homicides and on pace right now to be nearly as high as it was last year, which again was a record. A lot of concern. Gun violence clearly impacting people in that yeah, city. City officials have to get a control of that. It's, it, it's, it's wild. You can't believe it. All right, Stephen, thank you for that. When we come back, the frame of a home collapsing as it was being built, what we're learning about a construction worker trapped under all that debris. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed and the urgent search for a teenager in Utah. The family of Dylan Rounds is now offering a $100,000 reward for information leading to his whereabouts. 19, the 19 year old was last heard from a month ago while working and living on a remote farm near the state's border with Nevada. Authorities launching a criminal investigation after his truck was found at the property and a pair of his boots were discovered nearby. The FBI has joined the search. Two workers have been injured after a home collapsed while it was under construction near Austin. New video shows the damage after the structure came crashing down in, in manner. At least one worker trapped underneath, but he was pulled to safety. The cause of the collapse is now under investigation, but officials say high winds may be to blame. And some of the nation's largest retailers will limit purchases of morning after pills as demand skyrockets. CVS and Rite Aid capping purchases of Plan B and after to three per order, Walmart enacting a similar rule. The company says the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade is driving up demand and they want to keep supplies on the shelves. We now turn overseas where President Biden is in Madrid at an all-important NATO summit. Sweden and Finland take one step closer to joining NATO thanks to an agreement with holdout Turkey. Keir Simmons is at the summit where he's seen the alliance flexing its military might. Tonight, responding to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, involving more than 100,000 Russian troops, NATO is set to put a force of 300,000 on high alert. An unprecedented escalation, seven times the current number. As a Roman general once said, if you want peace, prepare for war. This constitutes the biggest overhaul of our collective defense and deterrence since the Cold War. But the West's response to Ukraine has Russia reacting, a kind of geopolitical tip for tat. NATO member Lithuania, now openly threatened by the Kremlin for enforcing sanctions on supplies to a Russian enclave, Kaliningrad. Is your view that the best form of defense is offense? We are not offensive country. We don't want to attack anybody. But, of course, we understand very much those threats which are coming. And probably nobody could understand the threats from Russia better than we. Is this a fight for democracy? It is uh, the fight for democracy. And this is not the fight what is happening now in Ukraine. This is not the fight uh, of one uh, country against other country. We have to stop uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia in Ukraine. Otherwise, there will be continuation of this aggression. The U.S. has a lot invested in this tense standoff. A hundred thousand American troops are stationed in Europe, preparing for a shift in posture. This week, leaders, including President Biden, meeting in the Spanish capital, will update NATO's strategy. Called the strategic concept, the last one described Russia as a potential partner. This time, it will say explicitly, Russia is a threat. An unmistakable message from here in Madrid to Moscow. Moscow claims it's not surprised. This month, mm -hmm. NATO will meet in Madrid and it will publish its new strategic concept. Yes. The first in a decade. Naming Russia a direct threat. This was the Kremlin spokesman speaking to me last week, repeating Russia's accusation that NATO has always been an offensive, not defensive organization. It was tailored is a gun. It's a message the Kremlin is telling the Russian people every day. This government-funded Moscow exhibition is called NATO Catalogue of Cruelty. 
NATO from the day of its formation to present day uh, constantly shows uh, kind of duplicity, like kind of um, duplicity, duplic kind of major difference between its uh, peaceful rhetoric and uh, actual policy. Every NATO controversy is on display. President Putin's early interest in Russia joining NATO is brushed over. The exhibition ends on Ukraine. Here we have uh, anti-tank missile containers made in uh, UK. For years now, uh, NATO has been providing Ukrainian military uh, with uh, weapons, equipment, means of communication, and basically uh, nurturing and uh, pumping uh, Ukrainian military machine. This exhibition looks like a justification for Russia's actions in Ukraine in the past few months. Maybe it looks like it, but uh, what we are trying to do here, what we are trying to, I don't want to say to make people do, but what, what we are trying to guide people into uh, is that people uh, think with their own heads. NATO and Russia sizing each other up in ways not seen for a generation. Both sides saying it has no other option. And with that, Kier joins top story tonight from Madrid, where the president has landed today. So, Kier, some major news tonight that we mentioned earlier, uh, the, the idea to expand NATO by admitting Sweden and Finland a go. What more can you tell us about that? Hey, Tom, that's right. Well, this was billed as the most important NATO meeting for a generation. And boy, on day one, it is living up uh, to that uh, billing. Turkey persuaded in a bunch of deal-making to accept Sweden and Finland joining the alliance. There was a conversation between President Biden and President Erdogan of Turkey earlier this week. Maybe that played a part. Tom, you know, there will be criticism of that deal-making in the de days ahead. But golly, uh, NATO uh, looks powerful and united tonight. It's not so long ago that President Trump described NATO as obsolete, that President Macron called NATO brain dead. No one is talking like that tonight, Tom. Okay, but, but, but here we do have to ask you, even though the members are now all agreed when it comes to expansion, there's still a number of issues that, that threaten the unity, though, correct? That is so right. It's, it's a great question. Just think about President Biden's challenges at home with his favorability ratings, with uh, the midterms looming. Then add to that political paralysis uh, in France. We don't know whether the prime minister of Britain will be the prime minister in the months ahead. In Germany, the chancellor has really struggled with uh, the Ukraine crisis. So we don't know whether the major countries of NATO will still be led by the same people uh, in uh, the years uh, to come. And there are leaders here, Tom, who, who are quietly saying we should keep lines of communication open with Moscow. We should be careful uh, not to encourage Moscow to escalate further because everybody agrees, again, that what we are seeing here is a generational change. This is a change to the posture towards Russia that is likely to last years, possibly decades, many leaders here say, Tom. Keir Simmons for us. Keir, we thank you for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with a deadly fire at a prison in Colombia. New video shows flames ripping through the facility after prisoners in Tulua tried to escape by lighting mattresses on fire. At least 51 inmates killed, another 30 people injured. Outside that prison, families of some of the inmates clashing with police as they demand answers into what happened. Colombia's president now ordering an investigation. Next to the search for survivors after a building collapse in India, at least 19 people are dead after part of the apartment building in Mumbai gave way during a heavy rainfall. Crews digging through rubble to save anyone still trapped under the rubble. Police say a labor contractor was arrested after renting out the house despite being aware of the building's unsafe condition. And a German court has sentenced former Nazi, a former Nazi guard to five years of prison for aiding murder. The 101-year-old man known as Joseph S., was convicted of more than 3,500 counts of accessory to murder. He's accused of working as an SS guard at a concentration camp during World War II. It's unclear if he'll actually face time behind bars. All right, coming on my top story, we head to Venezuela. Record high gas prices putting pressure on the White House to deal with nations long accused of human rights violations. How demand for oil may be leading to diplomatic backlash. Stay with us.
All right, we're back now with the Americas. U.S. officials seem to be cozying up to Venezuela. They say they're focusing on the safety of detained Americans, but with the U.S. gas crisis ongoing, some say there may be other factors at play. And a reminder, this is just coming a few years since the U.S. announced they did not recognize Nicolás Maduro as the leader of Venezuela. NBC Steve Patterson has more. Tonight, a tangled web of diplomacy, foreign policy, and power as U.S. officials quietly travel to Venezuela. The State Department describing the trip as a welfare visit, focusing on the imprisonment of several U.S. oil executives currently held in Caracas. But some say the objective of the trip has much broader implications. And I'm certain that discussions beyond the, the hostages are occurring. The discussion about reintegrating Venezuela into world oil markets, particularly as a source for U.S. and, and European oil demand. Nicolas Maduro has been pushing for the U.S. to ease oil sanctions established over the leader's rise to power as a socialist dictator and alleged humanitarian crimes against his own people. The visit comes with the U.S. in desperate need of a boost. The war in Ukraine has led to a 50 percent hike in oil prices, fueling the worst inflation in decades. Last week, the United States Emergency Oil Reserve fell by nearly 7 million barrels to its lowest level since 1989. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. This will be the second U.S. visit to Venezuela this year, after a surprise trip in March that led to the release of two American citizens and a promise from Maduro to jump start talks with the U.S.-backed opposition party led by Juan Guaido, the U.S. recognized head of state after rejecting Maduro's 2018 re-election as a sham. Despite this particular visit being about, uh, likely about prisoners uh, or hostages rather, but certainly uh, a lot more to unpack in terms of, you know, bringing about some normalization of U.S.-Venezuelan relations. Is normalization good when you have a leader like Maduro in power? Yeah, those are fair points. And again, I, I think it's important to note that isolation hasn't gotten us very far either, right? You know, two decades of isolation and, and persistent sanctions against Venezuela hasn't shaped Venezuela in the direction, you know, sort of advantageous to the United States. The meetings, while supported by some of the Democratic wing in Congress, have also led to bipartisan criticism. Here we are once again uh, working with dictatorships uh, in a way it doesn't stand up for our proposition of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. But the fuel crisis is putting pressure on the Biden administration to reestablish relations with oil-rich countries. Next month, President Biden will head to Saudi Arabia to meet with Arab leaders, including Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, implicated by the White House in the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, among several other human rights abuses. The president responded to criticisms over the trip. I'm not going to meet with MBS. I'm going to an international meeting. And he's going to be part of it, just like there were people part of the discussion today. Now, a new age of soul searching as the U.S. reopens the table to a list of the formerly condemned while reserves sink to new lows. All right, Steve Patterson joins us now. Steve, as you mentioned, the U.S. government insists their intentions in traveling are for welfare reasons. That's their quote. But has there been any recent indication the U.S. is looking to change the way they approach Venezuela moving forward? Tom, I spoke to experts. They say the broad strategy of trying to completely cut off Venezuela simply doesn't work. So no doubt part of all this is trying to bring them back into some level of conversation. If that does happen and the result is that oil is freed up from the region, it will take some time to have an impact on the international marketplace. So the risk of all this consideration has to be closely weighed against any diplomatic backlash it could cause. It really, really is a delicate balance. Yeah, and, and no doubt so many Venezuelans well, Americans are not going to like giving Maduro any type of opening over here yep. in the U.S. All right, Steve, we thank you for that. When we come back, Elvis may have sang about burning love, but 97-year-old Carl Hammer, he's living it. He just got married. It's a new type of love story, and wait till you see this kiss. We'll be right back. And finally tonight, the tale almost as old as time. Two Sacramento seniors showing Cupid sometimes strikes twice. Let's cut that cake and celebrate. At the Heritage Park Senior Living Community, a new type of love story. Here's the buzz. 97-year-old Carl Hammer, known as the Jam Man, has fallen for 95-year-old Reva Truitt. And don't let Carl fool you. He may be old, but he's still got game. But it's only about, been about five months that we've been dating, and it 
I mean, came. They're, they're two doors apart. And we both have back doors. <laughs> Those late night rendezvous turned into something more. These two lovebirds deciding to get married. The jam man describing their connection this way. It happens and when two sparks fire, you got a bonfire. And that's what we got. Right, and it's wonderful. The two saying I do, sealing the pack with that kiss. Carl, give her a break. The jam man going in for one more. Both Riva and Carl are widowed, now no longer alone, together for the rest of this journey and proving you're never too old to fall in love. And a big congrats to Carl and Riva. We hope you guys have a great honeymoon. That does it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.